afternoon, everybody. This is uh, James McLeod, Director of Community at Finos. Um, it's four o'clock in the afternoon, uh, British summertime and 11 a.m. Eastern time in the US. Uh, and you're here for our next Finos virtual meetup with Stephen Murphy, CEO of Genesis Global. Uh, Genesis being one of our new, newer um, members of the FinTech Open Source Foundation. And I'm really pleased to welcome Stephen here this afternoon for his talk on open source technology to build and constantly evolve a low code application platform. Um, but before we get started this afternoon, I'd like to let everybody know that we will be giving away um, some free Finos t-shirts, uh, which we actually pick at random for people who have subscribed to this event. Um, so if you want to be in with the chance of uh, winning a Finos t-shirt, uh, please um, go to our um, subscription page, which you'll be able to find on our, our LinkedIn page and uh, just enter your details and we'll be drawing those at random. Um, if you're not um, a member of um, the Finos uh, page on LinkedIn, um, feel free to go over to LinkedIn, um, look, search for Finos and then like us there. Equally, you can find us on Twitter and please visit finos.org for subscribing to our newsletters and getting involved where we have a get involved page. Um, and if you are a developer, please head towards um, github.com forward slash Finos to find the Finos organization on GitHub, where you'll be able to see all of our projects and start collaborating and also um, using our projects. Um, but that's enough about uh, Finos. I'd actually like to pass you over to Stephen at Genesis. Welcome, Stephen. Uh, thanks a lot for having me and organizing the webinar as well. Thank you. Thanks for everyone who's participating right now. And if you're watching the recording after the presentation, so thank you. Um, today, it was great that James and the team at Finos asked us to speak and talk about how we Genesis, um, which we have a, a ultimately a low code application platform, leveraged open source technology, both historically today and how we see that moving forward. And we thought the best way of doing that is ultimately talking a little bit about Genesis and some of the history, um, talking about our low code application platform, which has been built specifically for our industry. Some of the challenges of using open source, which I'm sure some of you have all seen and gone through or are about to go through if you're leveraging open source technology. Some lessons learned, uh, which we had in our experience over the last seven years, uh, as well as real life examples of open source technology within the Genesis platform. It's worthwhile noting we've also got some of the Genesis team on our call. Uh, we have Jose Pozo. He's been uh, he's our head of technical architecture for the platform and uh, server engineering. He's been there from day one, so he's lived and breathed all of these challenges and experiences that I'm going to talk to. Uh, and we also have Felipe Oliveira, our global head of sales and marketing, and faces of organized as we start to do more and more with Finos. Yeah, let me quickly go to the first slide. Um, really, some vision. Um, in this little timeline on the bottom here, I'll, I'll talk about what the timeline is. We, we've been around actually for over seven years now. Um, and I'm going to refer to this timeline in the presentation because the first three years of what I call the Genesis 0.0, .0 phase, uh, we were in pure R&D. We had no clients, um, but we were purely building from the ground up our, uh, our low-code application platform. And see some interesting history to this uh, later in the presentation. And really what, what we saw was there was a perfect storm in our industry um, and, and, and technology in general. We ultimately, a few things had happened. One, there was this concept of microservices. Obviously that word's widely used nowadays. It wasn't really used seven, eight years ago now. Um, and we've, we looked at this and said, if we could build a platform based on microservices, which then that platform was a low code application platform, that would change our industry. Um, it would allow us to either build or uh, solutions for our clients, or clients could buy solutions from us, but not a buy or build, it could be buy and or build, because we could use this LCAP, this low code application platform to solve that conundrum. Some other things which are perfect storm for us and the, the key topic today is open source. Uh, all of a sudden we didn't to build that, that low code application platform. There's a lot of open source technologies we could leverage versus having to go to commercial technologies to take components of software we needed. So that was a big thing for us in 2013, albeit that our industry and other industries were not somewhat open to open source technology at the time. 
cloud services, obviously infrastructure. It was very easy for us to load up infrastructure and ultimately we were self-funded. So that from a cost perspective, uh, that minimized our cost and the uh, time to market. And ultimately the industry was right for change. So we had this perfect storm and we had this vision that we wanted to be this, lead, this uh, low code application platform again, built for our industry. And we learned a lot during that process. So uh, when you think about the platform uh, and this low code application platform for our industry, ground up is a microservices based infrastructure, high scalable, resilient performance. It's got things specific to our industry, uh, business components, whether or not it's uh, Murex, Calypso, Fix, you know, the industry adapts with like Fix and FPML, Persian APIs, et cetera. And there's lots of tooling that we put around that, which allows you to have both no code, no code parts to the platform, as well as low code. What's really important to understand here is where every part of the platform, we use open source technology in some way, shape or form. Um, and as I mentioned previously in the previous slide, there's a, the, the, the open source technology and leverage in that was imperative, whether or not it was messaging and low latency uh, messaging infrastructure, all the way through to kind of web UI components. So it's used across the whole platform. Um, you can imagine, so there, there's, this is all great. Open source, uh, obviously, seven, eight years ago, it wasn't being widely adopted, so there's a number of challenges. Uh, in some areas within our stack, you'll see that open source technologies, there's emerged clear winners. Uh, and in some areas, there's still um, a variety of open source technologies which have pros and cons. So in some ways, open source is low code because uh, we're leveraging open source software, you need less code. So it's, uh, by the way, it's kind of heart, at the heart of a lot of things we've done. But there's challenges, right? So there's with, with, uh, as with so many open source technologies available, there's risks of choosing one of those technologies. Um, for instance, and these are just three of the challenges, there's, there's more so, but these are three that we, we, we wanted to highlight in the presentation. You could choose the wrong technology for the use case. We're going to discuss that in this, in this material. There could be better technology. So you choose one technology and guess what? Something happens or something comes along afterwards. Um, and also, if you need to change that technology, how much time and how much cost will be there? And a good example of this in the presentation is, you have these no SQL databases, but they've got their very specific APIs for their technology, which are not, uh, it's not easy to jump between one type of no SQL database to another no SQL database. So we, we had to weigh up those challenges. Uh, so we knew at the time we wanted to leverage as much open source as we could, uh, but we needed to make kind of decisions based on, uh, based on our priorities and our, and our use cases again. Specific use case, we think this is a, it, any entrepreneurs on the call will, will appreciate some of the highs and the lows. So uh, back in 2013, we started this journey and some of you may have heard of Foundation BB, a great piece of database technology. Um, we spent nearly, well, nearly uh, over two years leveraging this technology to be at the heart of our kind of in-memory name value pair database. Um, everything was going great and we thought we would have two years of R&D before we went to the market. And then something happened. Wrong way. Apple. Apple decided this was such great technology that they would acquire this technology. And therefore, it was no longer available in the open public domain to leverage. And uh, although we had 10 minutes of being very happy and very proud that we made a great technology decision to use Foundation DB because Apple acquired that technology to be their core part of their iCloud infrastructure storage, we also had that heartbreak moment that we'd ultimately made a decision where we were put at risk now of actually even taking our platform to market because we did ultimately have chosen to use Foundation DB. Ironically, after three years, uh, Apple actually open sourced Foundation DB. So it's kind of funny how there's swings and roundabouts, but during which time, we actually launched our low code application platform and we're already building solutions and products on that. Um, we actually realized, and there was a number of lessons learned, I'll talk about what happened post 2015, but it was quite an interesting uh, timeline for us uh, because we really kind of put all of our core database technology that we kind of built around Foundation DB. So for those people looking at their open source journey or are in their open source journey, we really had some lessons learned here. 
<clears throat> so we had the, the use of proprietary technologies post high risk, even though they were available in a public domain. Um, fortunately, we, we learned early in our journey. I say that fortunately now in 2020, it wasn't fortunately at the time, it was very unfortunately, but uh, from a long-term outlook perspective, it really was good for us. Um, it, it somewhat delayed our launch of our platform, but it was a good thing because of the approach we then took. And really what, that, what we decided at that point was at, within our platform, we had to provide some abstraction around core parts of the, of the system and the database, the, um, specifically not time series data, but standard data, which we have, uh, we would then actually add, add abstraction around that. And we've done that not just at a database level, we've also done that, for instance, in messaging, which I'm also gonna talk about later in the presentation. So our platform today, uh, we're much more in control of our own destiny. Um, and what we've been able to do is we've abstracted lessons learned, we actually abstracted our uh, database um, into an abstraction layer. And what we here now have is we, we support three different open source technologies. We support Aerospike, which also have a enterprise commercial arrangement, and there's a very good, very specific use cases we use them for. Foundation DB, uh, guess what? When they become open source again, we're already very used to using Foundation DB. And we also have Postgres. And again, Postgres is, um, you guys are probably very familiar with, the certain use cases where Postgres works extremely well as well. But our product developers and people use developing on the platform, when it, whether it's our own product development team or whether or not it's our clients, that's abstracted away from them. And again, so if there's a new open source technology, database technology in the future, we can also include that, but it won't be impacting the rest of the platform or the solutions and products we do on the platform. And so this, yeah, there's really, I wanted to delve into more when James and the team asked us to talk about Kind of where we've leveraged open source or why open source is so important to us at Genesis. It's really three good examples of where we use, uh, we use open source in the platform. Um, we're going to talk about them more uh, from a, this is really more the server side technology. As our event processing, uh, we ultimately use Reactive. Some of you on the call may be using that already or heard of that. It's a great technology for ultimate managing asynchronous event, event based. Uh, sequences of events and observables. The second piece is event and our notification message bus. We were initially using Zero MQ. Um, that was a great technology for us, easy to use, widely used. Um, but then we ultimately, as we, as, we, as we started to do more and more and our clients moved to the cloud, there was challenges around, around using Zero, Zero MQ in a multi-infrastructure multi cloud environment where there's multiple servers across different um, instances and that actually led us to actually move to Aeron so now within the platform we still have it that use um, it's abstracted to it. it could be using on queue we, we predominantly now use Aeron as our internal message bus and it's also worth noting that we also support Solis some of our clients have invested a lot of time money and energy and resources into Solis implementations so again that's abstracted we use Aeron but it, the platform is easily configured to leverage solid infrastructure that one of our clients may have invested in as well. And we're going to come, to come back to the database layer again in a second where we speak about the earlier scenario where we support three open source database technologies. Yeah, processing. So there's lots of, lots of great things to do with uh, Reactive there. It's, um, and Jose, like I mentioned, is on our call. So if any technical questions or details, he'll be able to answer at the end of the presentation or if we want to interject. Uh, provides a great level of extra abstraction around some of the real kind of low level threading, synchronization, thread safety, concurrent data structures, and IO. So that was a, a, a great, a great pro positive for us when we decided to use RX. It, simplif it simplifies asynchronous events that allows us to treat them as streams of events, which simplifies for our product solution developers using the low code application platform or our clients developers as well. Also, it's something which is widely used. So, for instance, it's used at, uh, by Microsoft and Netflix in their technology. Ultimately, it's, um, it's used for our different parts of their software solutions and our solutions, both at a database level, API, it could be a front end UI, through to a variety of um, libraries available out, out in as well. And then notification. So, as mentioned, we, we initially started with 0MQ. Um, great messaging bus for us initially. 
as we started that seven year journey, um, widely used um, and it was easy to get uh, for our core engineering team, watch Jose leads. Um, we had development resources that used Zero and Q in the past. But as we evolved and our industry evolved and more and more people were open to cloud enterprise on uh, installs, we recognized there were better technologies there. So our core engineering team, not our product and solutions team, then started to provide Aeron as an alternative. And ultimately, some of you are going to be already be aware of Aeron. It's very low latency, high performance uh, technology. It's also aligned with our industry as well, fixed messaging. So we have uh, fixed uh, components as well. Again, all based on Aeron to get the low latency, high speed and performance scalability in terms of messaging. So again, kind of similar to the database history where we went from uh, foundation DB to being stuck on what, what to use. Um, very similar in a similar way. We still do support zero MQ, but ultimately everything we do now is on Aeron. Um, and as I also mentioned in the, in the highlight points, is that we also support Solis. So we found a number of our clients have met and invested a lot to their Solis infrastructure and made that a prerequisite, a prerequirement to be able to integrate into their Solis infrastructure. And uh, we do that. So it can run seamlessly on Solis. And again, our product solution developers or our client developers is completely seamless to them because that's been an abstract way. For the database layer, as mentioned, not for we also support non time. Uh, this is for non time series data. Um, in, in our industry, we do have a lot of time series sequential data sets that we, we deal with as well. Uh, we use a different database open source technologies for that. Uh, so, yeah, as mentioned, Foundation DB um, is extremely good in terms of transaction processing, uh, asset guarantee transactions. Um, if you if, uh, you do some research, and uh, there's also links that I provided in this presentation. There's a lot of background to it, why they were so, and why Apple acquired them. We also use Aerospike. Um, lots of great things there. Aerospike is very good at um, single transaction type requests, and uh, what we have some called data servers of getting data extremely quickly. Well, recognized that they're used by a number of uh, firms like MasterCard credit card processing type companies. They're widely used. They're a very good name in the industry. Um, and we also use Postgres, uh, very traditional. Uh, when we go, when we've gone through procurement processes with some of our clients and they are not latency sensitive, um, they are, Postgres is extremely well recognized within the industry. So there's a lots of benefits of, of being able to support those three. And depending on the business use case, through some simple configuration uh, and using the platform, can choose what database mode you want to work in. Our product solution developers for our clients developers do not, they, they won't, that, that's abstracted away. They're just seeing the, um, the benefits of that depending on what mode they're running in. The other, the other good thing about Postgres and is that ultimately if you're, if you're as such po Postgres enabled, like the way we've developed our platform, we can leverage other technologies uh, which ultimately um, use the same protocol. So good examples of that would be a cockroach DB, for instance. So that there's lots of benefits that we've um, we seen from our being able to support Postgres at that level as well. Um, we've flown through a lot of that. Some of it was on purpose, so we can have a questions and answers. Uh, I, I suppose I wanted to end with why why Genesis and Finos, and why did we recently join Finos? We've been talking to the Finos community for a, a, a long time now. Hopefully, what you guys have seen from this is that. Ultimately, leveraging open source was the was at the very beginning of day one of, of Genesis uh, history. It was allowed us in that perfect storm uh, with a, a few other factors to really start the company, start our journey of building a low code application platform. So open source has been key. It's a, it's a core part of everything we do. So we we've, we've, we're very thankful to that, that that's happened in the industry. Ultimately, we want to contribute to open source. There's lots of things, especially Jose and the engineering team are involved in it around open source technologies. So we want to contribute in general to open source, but specifically those which are uh, very uh, relevant to our industry and a lot of the initiatives that Finos are leading and being involved with the community members. And ultimately, the specific uh, Finos initiatives we believe and we believe strongly about uh, that we want to contribute to as well. FTC3 financial objects are two great examples where standardization on data models and interoperability of messaging 
whether or not it be on the desktop or whether or not it's uh, via REST APIs on server-based technology, cloud. Um, even yesterday, James mentioned there was a, a new initiative around data masking. It's something that uh, we're very passionate about. We, we host most of our solutions for our clients. So therefore there's always that, um, that conversation discussion around how we mask uh, key sensitive data, client data or remodeling positions. Um, and how we go for a UAT cycle with our clients. So there's there's really, really important reasons for us to join Finos. Um, those are the three main ones. And we look forward to uh, doing more and more within Finos. Um, and finally, obviously, got everyone on the call, and if you're watching us, obviously, with the current pandemic crisis, thanks for participating. We hope you stay safe and well. James, you asked me to stay to 20 minutes, so that was 21 minutes, or 20 minutes. If you <laughs> but hopefully that, that was yeah, timed well. Absolutely. So I do have a couple of questions for you, but um, I'm pleased to say that um, Riz has been working in the background to um, pull a couple of people out of the hat um, who are going to win um, Finos t-shirts. Um, and I'm happy to say, well, I don't know if I'm happy to say that they're both um, from over here in, in the UK, but we have um, Sarah Durrani from Streets Consulting and also Mike Richardson from The Jurity Limited. Um, so Alexandra from the Finos team will be um, in contact with you to get your details um, and we'll get a Finos t-shirt over to you both. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to kick off the, um, the Q&A this afternoon. So if anybody else has got a question that you would like to ask Stephen, feel free to drop your question in the chat. Um, but in the meantime, um, Stephen, I was wondering, can you, um, can you answer this? Um, how ha has open source accelerated your development at Genesis and has it also um, saved you any cash, any costs? It's, um, if, you, if you imagine we use a benchmark outside of the finance industry and is of, the, of these low code application platform providers that it reduces time and cost by 80%, 80 plus percent. So we're gonna answer it in two sections. First thing, we see our low code application platform marketing cost by 80 plus percent. I, I would say the same is to be honest in, in many ways of different parts of different so, different open source technologies we used that it's accelerated. If we wanted to build that platform from scratch, it wouldn't have taken us three, four years, it would take us seven, eight years. There was, and I suppose some of it might be enough time, it wouldn't just be timing, huge cost. Imagine if you wanted a low latency in memory database, option one, Buy, your, uh, buy it from a, an, a, a one of the top tier technology can vendors in the world, comes at high cost. Option two, build it yourself, or that would be a huge amount of long time to build that yourself, maintain that yourself, and the cost of the resources to build that. So, so yeah, it was, um, if you imagine, whether or not it's the, how the messages go across the wire from a server to via REST or to a web UI, all the way through to that, the reason we wanted to talk about the database technology, as an example, is uh, having a highly scalable, resilient, and uh, low latency database technology uh, is no is no small thing. So therefore, you have to be able to um, you have to be able to um, be able to support that. And we, we we were able to leverage that without the need of um, going to do that ourselves or going to a commercial vendor and have a commercial relationship. So yeah, it's been key and it's saved us a huge amount of money and time. That's amazing. Um, and for people who are on the call who haven't um, come across low code, can you explain what low code is and how it enables financial services businesses? Great question. The, uh, it's something which we, we, we spend pretty much every day now, right now, uh, communicating with in the industry what we're doing. So, yeah, so uh, really, I, I think you can, when you talk about low code application platforms, you can really think of it as two sections. The first section is low code. And the second section, really think of it as an application platform. The low code, we really think of it in terms of within is being able to via configuration, it could be XML, it could be via our UI tooling, also uh, Java, Python, these which are languages we support, having a number of libraries for them, which allow them to build uh, solutions products extremely quickly. Let's give an example of that. Uh, Two-phase validation of transactions. It's something that you need across many different industries. It's also something very important to financial markets and capital markets. 
So when we say two-phase validation, the concept of warnings and errors. The warning is like, I want to put an, a new order in, but I might have breached my risk limits. And that could be a warning to say, I recognize that, but I, I can still do that. Or a hard error, which means you can recognize you've tried to do it, but you cannot do it. That's low code. So you can imagine when I talk, we talk about low code, it's really accelerating the development process. And when that can either be done through uh, um, our tooling, our configuration, or still uh, getting into some of the Java and Python if you want to do so, if you don't, don't want to use the configuration on the low code tooling. The other aspect is the application platform. The application platform is, is actually the platform which runs that, it's the actual infrastructure that runs the, the solution. So you've got all the development, and you can imagine the rest of it being also part of the, the delivery upgrades that the DevOps. So it's the actual running of those underneath the covers is a microservices infrastructure. So ultimately that you can also be running those solutions, knowing it, knowing that it's a being run on again a highly resilient, scalable technology. And when we built this low-code application platform, Docker, Kubernetes, these things didn't exist as well. So a lot of our clients initially wanted it as on-prem installs. So we've evolved as well to support cloud by default um, and horizontal scalability, list acidity, all of those things as well. Yeah, that, that's what low-code and the application platform and LCAP as it's known, um, what that means. Sebastian, thank you. Thank you for answering that. And I, I'll just, to, I'd like to remind everybody who's on the line that we do have a few minutes left with um, Stephen for anybody who would like to ask a question to him and, and the Genesis team. Um, but in the meantime, as you'll, as you'll type in, in the chat, um, I'd like to um, say you are a Finos member. So we met, we mentioned at the beginning um, of the um, of the meetup that you are a Finos member. But I'd like to know how do you plan to either leverage Finos projects, or how are you actually leveraging Finos projects now? Uh, great question. We I suppose one some of the thing which is top of mind for, for me personally, I think there's um, two areas where we're really trying to leverage Finos. Earlier in the presentation, we spoke about these business components. And what we see is that there's a great opportunity for the industry to standardize um, data schemes and ultimately this, this, this initiative called financial objects. So that as you, as you start to integrate more, whether or not you're a hedge fund, an asset management firm, a clearing house, we have a, we have a new product that we've built in partnership right around syndicated loans. Got another, now, so you've seen, we've seen certain parts of the industry have done a lot around standardization. If you look at the FIX messaging protocol, uh, FPML, for instance, as well. There's certain areas of the industry which has not had gone through that uh, standardization and uh, working together to a, in an, as an open source community. So the areas that we're, we're really, we're, I suppose the, the initial areas where we really are keen to um, be involved in is both the financial objects and FDC3. They're both, both quite uh, tightly linked, as you know, um, because of, if you're just, finding standards of, of message structures uh, within FDC3 for desktop interoperability. There's a lot of reuse for that. It can be applied to the financial objects um, initiative. So yeah, we, we, that's, that's an area initially for us. That said, we've done a huge amount within the cloud already. Um, so there's other parts of the, of the uh, Finos initiatives that we want to be involved in. Yesterday, you mentioned data masking. That is a really big one for us because we do that today. Uh, for a lot of our clients, because as mentioned, we host the majority of our products and solutions for our clients. So yeah, I, I think with the ones I listed on that final slide, FTC3 financial objects, uh, we, we are gonna be involved in from, from the day one. And there's other stuff we're definitely interested in to help lead uh, both in terms of cloud and data masking. Brilliant. And for the people on the line who are um, interested in what Stephen's referring to, um, at the moment, we're receiving a contribution into Finos um, called Synthetic Data Hub. Um, and I'm working with the team at the moment to, to schedule a webinar for the future so they can actually take us through, you know, what that technology is and what it actually brings into the foundation. Um, and then finally, the very final question will be, across all of the open source landscape that you're using within Genesis, has the engineering team had the opportunity to contribute back to any of the um, open source that you are consuming? We have, but we've not done that uh, within any of the Finos initiatives yet. We were waiting to become official members. So I think um, it's probably worth noting as well 
we have a, a recent hire, and I think this is, um, shows our commitment and why we started to be part of FinOS and the open source initiatives. Uh, uh, also, we've had Nick Cobra join us as well. So uh, we're looking forward to Nick being more and more, uh, continuing what he's doing, which is obviously an amazing leader, amazing leader within the industry around FDC3. So we also continue to see contributions in that space. Uh, we love what's happening in that space and we'll do more so ourselves. Uh, but yeah, you'll see from the other FinOS initiatives that we'll start contributing on those FinOS specific initiatives as well. So yes, we are one, we were doing those in more non-FinOS FinOS, um, open source initiatives. Uh, but for the FinOS specific ones, with Nick joining us, as well as the things which are really, really have been key for us and we've wanted to contribute. Now we are finally members, we're definitely contributing within the kind of financial objects, cloud and data masking and, and others, wherever we can, we obviously want to contribute. And a number of the, our clients are already FinOS members. And in some cases, a number of our clients are part of the leadership of the different FinOS initiatives. So the answer is yes and yes, if this. Yeah, that's brilliant. And I'd like to um, welcome Nick um, to the Genesis team. Thank you very much for letting us know about that. And um, if anybody's interested in, in looking or, you know, joining Nick's FDC3 1.1 project, um, feel free to come into to Finos and, you know, I'll um, introduce you to the team. Um, and also Nick um, did actually record a webinar and a podcast with us. Um, just a few weeks back and so feel free to you know um, come onto our LinkedIn page where all of the links are. Um, thank you for that. Um, okay so thank you very much Stephen. We're actually at the end of our time together on um, our webinar this afternoon. It's been um, extremely insightful into Genesis and you know how you're leveraging um, open source for your application platform. Um, we're all very exciting uh, for having Genesis as members of FinOS and look forward to working with you, Nick, and the team even more as we move forward through our journey together. Thank you very much. Thanks for everyone for listening as well. Thank you.